our next speaker uh, is the first of the, the two back-to-back -back lightning talks we're going to have. Uh, David Apirian is founder and CEO of Trunk.io, a company focused on building a next-gen developer experience platform. Uh, he will be talking about mono repos and their relevance in a world increasingly dominated by microservices. Uh, prior to that, David held uh, engineering leadership roles uh, at Uber's Advanced Technology Group. And um, thank you for joining us, David. Thanks. Hi, so this is a lightning talk on the shift to monorepos of microservices. Monorepos are still in the minority, but just in the last couple of years, we've started to see that they're being used a little bit more. Um, this shift is very young, they are gaining steam. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about the reasons to move to a monorepo, the challenges of moving to a monorepo, and an overview of the tools that are enabling the shift now that prevented a lot of companies from moving to monorepos a lot earlier. Before we get started, how many organizations here use monorepos? Whoa, okay, maybe, maybe a quarter uh, or you know, 20%. And how many have debated about using monorepos in the last year? About the same number. So that is interesting. Monorepos are always a favorite topic for engineers to argue about. <laughs> like I said, there's a new wave of companies moving to monorepos. Um, but some of the most well-known monorepo users are these big tech companies. Uh, some of the most successful and biggest tech companies have been using monorepos for a while. They've invested heavily in making them work for them with extensive internal, internal tool suites that for the most part aren't available commercially. Um, and so that's been a problem for everybody else trying to adopt a monorepo setup. All of these companies don't necessarily use a single monorepo. Some people call this concept mega repos. And, but they do all use large repos that contain many distinct projects uh, where hundreds, you know, somewhere between tens and thousands of engineers work out of each repo. Google, of course, uses a single mono repo. It's called Google 3. It's their third try at this. Uh, and they have tens of thousands of engineers that work out of it. So we're going to look at why companies like these and a new wave of much younger companies are, are kind of gravitate towards mono repos. I'm gonna focus on four reasons. There's a lot of reasons why to use a monorepo. Earlier we heard about measuring developer productivity. The meta reason to make, to care about this stuff or to potentially move to a monorepo is developer productivity and raising the engineering bar. Those are kind of the, the root reasons to do anything. Um, these four reasons I think are a, a little underrepresented in normal speaking about monorepos, so I'm gonna talk about that now. An internal open source culture is when you allow every engineer in your company to modify any code, see any code, contribute to any code, even outside of their project. It's a generally good thing that people strive for, but feasibility of actually doing that matters. If the bar for an engineer to contribute to another project, say a small change, something they noticed in the product, they want it to be a little bit different. If the bar to doing that is effectively to ramp up at a different company, because everything about contributing to this other repo is different, it requires a different development environment, the test suites are different, how to test code is different, nobody's gonna do it. And so in a monorepo, building and testing code in any part of the repo is very similar, if not identical, to any other part of the repo, um, and it actually becomes a feasible thing to do. The other thing about internal open source culture is that the more eyes you have on more parts of your repo and the more visible that is to more people, it kind of raises the engineering bar across the whole org, which is always a great thing. When you have hundreds or thousands of repos, some of those repos are sort of hiding very not good engineering practices. Another aspect is cross-cutting changes. You can make a single git commit that changes multiple projects at a time. This could be upgrading a service API to something more optimal uh, across many projects at a time, or it could be changing a library and all the users of the library, library at the same time. There's also a low overhead to create projects, new projects. You effectively just need to make a directory and start coding in it because CI is done for you, how to test code is done for you, deployment pipelines are done for you. You don't have all of the boilerplate of bringing up a new project. And finally, it's much easier to share code in a monorepo, but it's importantly, much easier to discover code to reuse in a monorepo. You know, as we scale engineering organizations, we basically get less efficient. It's sort of a, a root truth of scaling engineering organizations, but there are a few ways 
You can mitigate that. Code reuse is one of them. If we function in a way where every three-person team or five-person team in our organization recreates much of the same logic over and over and over again, it's wildly inefficient. So I have, I've dealt with monorepos at scale, and there's definitely, it is not, it is not just a pure win to move to a monorepo. There are some huge challenges in doing it. I'm gonna focus on the three biggest problems. Uh, one of them is that building and testing is just much slower. It's hard to get around this. Monorepos have a lot more tests. In a small repo, you might have dozens of tests. You just run every test on every change to that repo. In a monorepo, you might have 10,000 tests. You can't do that. Testing is also flakier. Uh, you don't necessarily, tests aren't necessarily flakier per se in a monorepo versus any other repo setup, but because you're running so many more flaky tests, so many more tests, flaky tests affect other engineers more. They wind up having CI jobs on their pull requests failing due to tests that are not necessarily their fault. And finally, merging is more painful. Um, the more engineers you have working out of the same repo, the more chance there is for logical merge conflicts. This happens when two engineers make changes at the same time that independently function, but when merged together to, onto the main or master branch, uh, something, some functionality breaks about that, and it causes a, a broken main or bro broken master. And, and that can affect everyone else in the same way that on their PRs or, or locally on their machines, they're seeing tests fail that aren't their fault. That kills productivity. Thankfully, successful monorepos are a game of tooling. Uh, there are, we're just now getting to a place in the world where there are good commercial options uh, commercial and open source options to run a successful mono repo where in previous years really only the biggest tech companies that uh, invested in this heavily had the capability of doing that. So I'm going to talk about five categories of tools that you need to run a successful, start a successful mono repo. Number one are, is mono repo build and test systems. So monorepo build and test systems, with these you mark up as configuration next to your code all of the inputs, outputs, and dependencies, <coughs> inputs, outputs, and dependencies of libraries, binaries, tasks, even containers. Um, with this information, these systems uh, build your code, test your code, but also have a dependency graph of all of your code. You can visualize this and gain insights about your code, do things like identify dependencies that shouldn't be there and are wrong and eliminate those. Uh, but you can also answer the question, for any given pull request in this mono repo, here's, here's the set of changes that it changed, what test should I run? And you can do that, it, it does this because it has a dependency graph. When you're using a system like these, it also opens the door to using a remote build and test caching and execution system. These are services that are built on top of these mono repo build and test services. <laughs> and they basically just speed you up because the mono repo build and test services, uh, systems have all the inputs and outputs of everything you're trying to build and test, it opens the door for both local and remote caching and uh, remote building and, and remote test execution. And you'll see the theme here with monorepos is the biggest challenge is getting testing to work well and fast. So another aspect here is test monitoring. There are a bunch of tools now available uh, to monitor for flaky tests, for tests that spuriously get slower, which is sort of an insidious thing that most people are not looking for today, you have to keep these under control in a monorepo, or because you're running so many more tests, it does wind up blocking a lot of pull requests and lowering productivity. Um, next, code checking. You can add extensive code checking to any kind of repo, any size repo, uh, but the cost to benefit ratio of doing that to a small repo when a few people are working out of it is, is not very good and it's almost never done. So there really is a great aspect of a mono repo where if you put the time into automating as much as possible, it actually has really great return on overall developer productivity because it's applying to so many more people. Instead of, it, it basically costs the same to set a lot of this stuff up in a repo that three people work out of as it does in a repo that 300 people work out of, but the latter obviously has a much bigger impact. And finally, merge queues. Merge queues are the solution to logical merge conflicts. They prevent them. Many companies <laughs> have built this themselves for years, so 
Uber, Shopify, Twitter, Airbnb, Robinhood, and many others have built their own merge queues. They're very sophisticated, and some of them have white papers floating around about how they keep velocity high in merge queues. With a merge queue, instead of developers merging code directly onto your main or, or whatever your main branch is, you instead queue them to be merged in the merge queue. It goes through an extra level of testing with everything else that has been submitted to the merge queue, and then if that passes, lands the, lands the pull request, lands the changes on, onto your main branch. Um, there are some startups now, like, like mine, trunk.io, that have really sophisticated good options for merge queues. They also provide a sort of better uh, developer workflow around merging, so a lot of even smaller repos and smaller companies use these just for that aspect. This was a very short talk. Uh, this is, those are the five tools, there are the five categories of tools uh, for a successful monorepo. There's a lot of nuance and difficulty in, in building a monorepo that is scalable and productive for folks. So uh, I'll be around after this, and if you're interested in monorepos or any aspect of developer experience, uh, come, come find me, and I'm happy to chat. Thank you. <laughs>